Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Robert Coho Epstein. The past being a rather multifaceted area, I do not claim to be speaking about all aspects of it. But I would just like to talk about the pastness of the past tonight and compare it to the present and then see uh, if they have a relationship with each other. So first, a couple of kind of introductory ideas uh, that may or may not apply. And it may be that as I go through, some ideas repeat or intertwine. And so I apologize uh, for any redundancies or overlaps. And um, I'd like to apologize again in advance so that I can establish a little bit of pre-redundancy. So I've been baking bread uh, ever since COVID hit. The psychic uh, transmission that many people got that somehow they should bake fresh sourdough bread uh, arrived in my mind. I thought it was an original thought, but it was not. I think it probably comes from aliens. And um, I started baking sourdough bread. And I thought, you know, we're stuck here with COVID uh, being around. And wouldn't it be great to have fresh bread, fresh bread, bread that is fresh, as opposed to the stuff you buy in the store. And the thing about fresh bread I discovered after baking now several hundred breads um, is that it's only fresh for about this long. And then it's old. So you've got to really eat it rather quickly, but you can't eat that much bread that quickly. So it's fresh for a moment. And you also have to wait for it to cool down before you are supposed to be able to cut it. So somewhere in there, you cut the bread at the right time, you get a little bit of fresh bread, then the fresh bread part of it is over. Uh, And you're busy uh, trying to make it fresh again or toast it or do or eat it a little bit stale and make believe it tastes just as good as it did when it was fresh. It's either too new, fresh for just a too short a period of time, or then it's too old. That's sort of the way time goes. Uh, And life is kind of like that too. Um, First, you're too young to do certain things, so you can't do them, or you're not allowed to do them. And then you are working and you don't have enough money and you have to stay and do your job pretty constantly. So you can't go and do anything, even though you're now allowed to, and you could, if you, if you were able to, you could do it. Then finally you retire and you still don't have enough money and you're too old to do a lot of traveling. So basically you have this timeline where you never get to do anything. I'm I'm exaggerating a little bit. But uh, life sort of goes by with along this timeline. And um, it's never exactly the right time. So when is the right time to have your life? When is the right time to live? Um, When time keeps going by like that, it really seems like it gets away from us. And all of that takes place in the timeline or the narrative of our lives which is constantly changing and pushing forwards towards a new unstable condition, which then changes again. And that's, that's the way time and our reality in samsara goes with dependent origination and constant change, anika, uh, in Buddhist terms. Uh, the timeline seems to go across horizontally when we think about it, at least I see it that way sort of like from left to right, like reading a book. So I'll point to the past to to my left. Oh, that happened before. And uh, the future is either ahead of me or sometimes it's to the right. Oh yeah, I'm gonna do that later. And I'll, so there's kind of like a a literal linear uh, mental construction there about how time is going by. And the present is somewhere in the middle, often not attended, thinking about what happened and what I have to do next. However it occurs in your mental space, it goes in a direction that appears to have an undisclosed beginning and end, 
and it goes from one event to the next until an assumed stopping point somewhere in the distant future. But there's another aspect of time, and that is the moment, the now moment, the present. And of course, we try to focus on that moment, this moment in Zen, instead of getting carried away to all kinds of different imaginary locations. Uh, the present moment doesn't go in time increments from left to right or from event to event. Uh, you could say it has, instead of being horizontal, it has kind of a vertical axis. And it's always pointing to what is right now, rather than going across from one thing to another. And that moment is always present, because it is the present. And it's also always accessible because it's always here because it's always now. Uh, it's only our minds that wander. The moment doesn't ever run away from us, but we run away from it into our mental space and think that there's another time that we can compare it to. When we're centered in the present moment, the narrative of time seems to run through that central space rather than taking us away from it. In our mental space, we construct and reconstruct the past. If we pay attention in the now moment and think about the past, if we really look at it, we can see that we're always selecting a partial view of the past and then assigning it a meaning or assuming that we know what it's about. You know, I may think about the last time I saw my aunt and say, oh, I remember when my aunt said this particular thing to me. And then when I saw her again, I reminded her about it and we discussed it. Well. That really, that could have really happened, and it could be somewhat the way I remember it, but I am taking a few impressions out of this collection of past events, and I'm highlighting them and creating a little story out of it. So it's not the past, it's one little strand of a version of the past. Um, I've selected a partial timeline of the past, moving towards the present, and then filling in the blanks with impressions or images that I have collected or stored. Um, all of that is done through an act of cognition. It's a thought process. And none of it really exists outside of my mind, which is something that is kind of hard for us to accept. I mean, we, we kind of know that intellectually, but we don't really grasp that all of that past, including what happened a few seconds ago, is really only still existing in a mental space as mental impressions. It's not really here anymore at all. Um, <clears throat> it's hard to accept that as soon as things happen, they're no longer there. Because of the kinds of minds we have, uh, we don't see that their reality is that temporary. We try to hold on to the idea that they're still real and that they're still there in some form. And they are still around, but only as a, a mental impression or a set of mental impressions, which we continue to give meaning. So basically, we reconstruct the past over and over again, and we always do it in the moment because that's all there is. Um, we think the past timeline is like a movie, you know, it's running towards the present moment and it's flowing along like when we watch a film. But in actuality, it's really more like a collage. You know, we have this collection of mental impressions kind of in this uh, stew of the mind, uh, all kinds of thoughts and experiences and memories. And, uh, you know, we pick out the ones that fit with a particular uh, story or a particular intention. Like, you know, oh, I'm gonna see this person uh, tonight and haven't seen them in a while. What was it like the last time we got together? So I'll pick that out and connect it to what I expect to happen next. Um, if we drop that whole narrative and that whole collection for a moment, uh, the picture of the past that we are normally constructing, we're left with the present experience and we no longer have that story about who we are, what we do, what we've already done, what we're gonna do next which is all in the mind. So at the, if you can drop that for a moment, you're no longer 
an accountant or a musician or a construction worker with this set of relationships and, you know, this family, you're just yourself. Uh, if I take away my self definitions, I'm just me sitting here with my thoughts and my senses taking in what's in front of me or what's arising in the mind at the moment. But I can see if I'm doing that, that it's just mental material. And if we start taking those elements away that we associate as parts of ourself, we can start to see that our self definition is a mental construction too, made up of thoughts and ideas and is not a real thing at all. I don't mean to disparage it by saying that it's not real, but <laughs> it's not there. <laughs> so what are we in the moment with all those ideas put aside? What is our actual existence? In fact, let, let, me, let me backtrack for a tiny second. So it seems like it's all part of this larger story and we can sketch that out too. You know, we're creating this narrative of who we are and giving it a context. It seems like part of a larger story um, and all of those elements are also mind constructions. So we have friends and family, we're part of this group, we exist in this culture, we're part of this country, which exists in a world which is on this planet that we've never seen unless we happen to go to outer space in the solar system, which we've read about. And as far as our direct experience in the moment, that's also all a story. So we have our personal story, then we have the larger context that everybody, the same story that everybody tells each other. Um, and not to deny science, because I, all of that is very factual. In fact, we do exist in an interconnected way, um, but to experience that is different than the story of self that we keep reconstructing from moment to moment. The Buddha called the elements of mental and perceptual experience the five heaps, the five skandhas. And in this sense of constant readjustment and reconstruction to create the impression of a stable self, they really are like heaps of sand that we have to work hard and expend a lot of energy, piling them up and straightening them out and making sure they don't fall down to reincorporate whatever happens uh, into a coherent narrative within the story of ourself. New things keep happening, so we have to keep incorporating those into our narrative about who we are. If we consider the past for a moment and see what's there and see that it all exists in the mind, we can see that these impressions are stored mental impressions that are actually appearing in the present moment. But they give the impression of occurring in a past time because of how we name them and describe them to ourselves. In the empty space of the mind, thoughts, memories, and descriptions arise and fall away. Thoughts. And some of them have the function of assembling these groups of mental impressions and defining them within a coherent narrative of self. This story of self is actually empty, as is the mental space in which it occurs, but it's made to appear very full and concrete and have a lot of substance. The Diamond Sutra notes that we create identities for things and people and for ourselves by the way we name and define them. Uh, you know, and there's the famous example of the Bodhisattva. The Bodhisattva is doing a good in various ways and being there to serve beings. But when we start defining ourselves or someone else as a Bodhisattva, then we are stuck with the name and definition of that no longer with the reality. So we're, we block the reality uh, with our uh, name and form constructions. So that cuts off the larger reality from our understanding. And then there's the story of Pai Chang and the duck. Once when great master Ma and Pai Chang uh, were walking together, they saw some wild ducks fly by. The great master said, what is that? Chang said, falling into the trap, he said, wild ducks. The great master said, where have they gone? Because they were flying by. Chang said, they've flown away. The great master then twisted Pai Chang's nose, common procedure in those days. Uh, Chang cried out in pain and the great master said, when have they ever flown away? When have they ever flown away? So 
he's pointing out that if you're holding on to your mental impression of a past event and still thinking it's real, you're deluded. You're, you're, you are engaging a delusion as a reality. The sense of a coherent past, which we construct, that is congruent with the present and promises a logical future coming soon, all of which fits together very nicely uh, and continues to flow in a logical manner, is deeply connected to defining a coherent and logical story of self, a stable self in a stable world that doesn't actually exist. <laughs>